Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. <clears throat> the Israelites called Jerusalem home because they believed God lived in Jerusalem. Yet the Babylonian exile robbed them not just of their home, but their identity, their welfare, and their perceived proximity to God. The prophet Jeremiah delivers a startling message to those in Babylon to settle in, build homes, and plant gardens in that foreign land. So there are some questions we need to ask today. What does this mean for those in exile? What, where does God dwell when we are uprooted? What does God, what does love say when our dreams unravel? because their dreams had unraveled. The Hebrew people had fallen apart. Jerusalem has been destroyed. Their greatest and their best had been carried away into captivity. And the dream those in Babylon had constructed for when they would return has now begun to unravel. Because of exile, Jerusalem has unraveled and so has the very identity of the Israelites. Yet this harsh reality of exile unravels into a vision with a possibility. But there's a problem. There's a problem going on with all this unraveling. There is a problem occurring in the midst of this unraveling. You can see it here in Jeremiah 29. You can see it in two chapters earlier in Jeremiah 27. 16 through 17. You see, Jeremiah is concerned because there are false prophets that have arisen. These false prophets are sharing a message. And the false prophets are telling the Hebrew people, everything's going to be all right. So don't worry about it. We're all going back to Jerusalem. Everything's going to go back to the way it used to be. Don't you worry. Everything's going to be all right. But Jeremiah says these are false prophets. Jeremiah is telling them, don't listen to those who say everything's going to go back to the way it was before, because it's not. Now we have to realize Jeremiah is speaking from a place that might appear to be one of privilege. You see, those in Babylon will see Jeremiah is, as still living in the place where God dwells. But in reality, he is living in a place that has been decimated by invaders. Jeremiah is the only prophet who's willing to tell the people what God is really saying about their circumstances. He is called the weeping prophet for a reason. And he does not have what appears to be good news for the generation that is going through this time of trouble. Their dreams have unraveled. Their hopes have unraveled. Their communities have unraveled. And so as we go into this message today, I want you to hear these words from Dietrich Bonhoeffer about community. It's from his book, Life Together. It is my favorite of Bonhoeffer's books. Every human idealized image that is brought into the Christian community is a hindrance to genuine community and must be broken up so that genuine community can survive. Those who love their dream of a Christian community more than the Christian community itself become destroyers of that community, even though their personal intentions may be ever so honest, earnest, and sacrificial. God hates this wishful dreaming because it makes the dreamer proud and pretentious. Those who dream of this idealized community demand that it be fulfilled by God, by others, and by themselves. They enter the community of Christians with their demands, set up their own law, and judge one another and serve God accordingly. They stand adamant, a living reproach to all others in the circle of this community. The bright day of Christian community dawns 
wherever the early morning mists of dreamy visions are lifting. And that's what I seek to do in this message today. I seek to lift away those mists of dreamy visions to look at the true unraveling we have experienced. With these ideas of dreamy visions lifting, I want you to ask yourself today, what is the American dream? What do you think the American dream is? I'm going to tell you what I was taught the American dream is. The American dream was taught to me is that if you work hard, anything you put your mind to, you can accomplish. If you just work and you try hard, anything you do, you can accomplish. You'll be able to have a home. You'll be able to have land. You'll be able to have all of these things if you work hard enough. And I was taught that <clears throat> as a very young boy, both by my mother and my father. But as I began to grow, and even as a little boy, I began to realize that this American dream was meant only for people that looked like me, white working class, and I began to realize that this American dream wasn't for everyone. I first real, I realized it in three distinct areas in my life, and I look back on them. The first time I began to realize this was when I was roughly 10 years old. I was living in West Texas with my father. My father was an old field worker. He ran heavy machinery. And we were living in West Texas as he was doing that. And I went to school for the first time at a school where I was in the racial minority. The majority of the other students were Hispanic. And it was a different experience for me, but it was one I was enjoying. I was making friends. I was talking with people, but it was a different world. I'd never heard that much Spanish spoken in a room. And it was a really interesting experience. And I, I loved the other students. I enjoyed my time there. But I began to realize that these students had hardworking parents. But the American dream wasn't for them because I would come home and my dad would say that immigration pulled over another bus today. Now, by bus, he meant the people they were busing out to the oil fields to work. And he would tell me that the parents of the kids I went to school with had been deported. These hardworking men who had been out on the oil field working and sweating and bleeding just like everyone else were deported and their children were left behind. That began to shake my vision of the American dream because it said that these hardworking people weren't a part of that dream. The next time I remember having my American dream shaken, I was by this time living in Louisiana. I was living with my mother again, and I was going to school in a small town. And while I was going to school in that small town, I began to... Uh, make friends and not too many friends. I was a little too geeky to make a lot of friends, but I was trying to make friends. And I remember I was probably 15, maybe 16. And I had made friends with one of the guys in my class who just happened to be African-American. And I told him one day, I said, hey, let's go out and do something this weekend. And he looked at me and his eyes were sad and he said, Derek, if me and you started hanging out, people would be thinking one of us is selling drugs to the other. Because you see, in the backwoods of Louisiana in the 1980s, the only reason in his mind that a geeky redneck and a young black man might hang out to other people, the only reason in their minds would be that we were selling drugs to each other. And my vision of the American dream began to crumble. And I think the last and final straw occurred when I was 19 or 20 years old. And I hope you won't be offended about this one, but I was sitting in a bar in Monroe, Louisiana. I was hanging out with a guy, another black gentleman, 
and much older than I am. And he'd known me since I was 14. We'd grown, uh, he'd seen me grow up in the pool hall, shooting pool with him and hanging out. And he and I were talking. And he explained to me something that just really shook me to the core and has affected my life even more since then. And what he said to me, he said, Derek, he said, one of the things you need to understand is that a person of color and a poor young white man like yourself have a lot in common in the sense of economic inequities. Now, at 19, 20 years old, I didn't know a whole lot about what economic inequity meant. But he began to explain it to me. He began to talk to me about it. And I said, well, that makes sense. He said, but Derek, there's a difference. He said, Derek, you can get out of here, get out of this bar, you can put on a suit and tie, you can change the way you talk, don't sound like this no more, boy. Here's what he said, don't sound so country. He said, you can change the way you talk, you can change the way you dress, and people will immediately treat you differently. But he said, no matter how well I dress, no matter how well I talk, no matter how educated I am, people will immediately judge me based on the color of my skin. And at that point, I think my last vestiges of what I'd been taught as the American dream began to slip away. Now, like Jeremiah, it may appear to you that I am speaking from a place of privilege. But this so-called American dream was problematic for me. It kept me locked into some ideal that was never truly attainable and blinded me to those who had no access to it. This American dream also brings destruction upon us white folks because it has blinded us to the pain of our brothers and sisters of color. It also blinds us to their very humanity because it makes it seem as if they, like the exiles in Babylon, are removed from us and in doing so, takes away from the unique pain they are experiencing. The American dream has never been a full reality for every person in our country. While it has been slowly evolving and improving over time, for it to ever come to fruition, it must continue to grow and change to include everyone. The so-called American dream was only a reality at first for those who owned land for quite some time. Then eventually it became, began to become a reality for those who might not own land. But that dream has only been slowly growing, has only been a slowly growing reality for people of color. And for many it is still a myth that has no foundation in the real world. It could never be a reality, this American dream, for America, until as a nation, we repent of our original sin of slavery, which is rooted in that demonic force known as racism. The original sin of slavery still holds its grip on our country in the way people of color are treated by those in power. We see it time and again on the news. We read about it, we hear about it, and if we're open and talk to people of color, we hear firsthand what it's like. John Wesley, whom we refer to in the United Methodist Church as the founder of Methodism, thoroughly repudiated slavery in his pamphlet, Thoughts Upon Slavery. Yet American Methodists allowed it to split our church, and I do not believe we have fully ever repented of the excesses of our ancestors. And so God is calling us to a corporate repentance as a nation and as a people and as Christians. Now, corporate repentance isn't something we like to talk about. We like to talk about repenting of our individual sins because we are highly individualist. But Sean Brace, a Seventh-day Adventist minister, puts it this way. The challenge is that American Christians have been shaped by the worldview of Western individualism more than by the worldview of the Bible. And those who resist the gross individualism that has shaped American culture for centuries 
understand the very critical and important concept of corporate solidarity and repentance. Simply put, according to the scriptures, we are all part of the great web of humanity. The Bible is saturated with this corporate thinking from cover to cover, starting right there in Genesis 1, where the Godhead itself is referred to in both singular and plural terminology, right alongside each other. Today, after all, is Trinity Sunday, and the very corporate nature of God should point us to the corporate nature of humanity. God did say, let us make man in our image. And such a pattern is repeated throughout the Hebrew Bible in practically every chapter. When God calls Abraham in Genesis 12, he declares that in you all, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Abraham understood the implications, of course. He himself would not physically encounter every family in the entire world personally doling out blessings, but he recognized that through his extended family, ultimately, of course, through Christ the Savior, that every family in the whole world would be affected by this blessing. Even though Abraham as an individual would not physically enact the blessing, it was as though he would be the one doing it through his family. This corporate concept is one our Jewish brothers and sisters understand better than we do, since they have had a little more excess in resisting the individualistic mindset of the West. And I would dare say it is something that our black brothers and sisters have understood better as well, since oppression tends to galvanize a people because of their shared trauma. Recognizing this underlying scriptural motif has tremendous implications for the way we interact with racial reconciliation. Not only should it give us a greater empathy for our oppressed brothers and sisters, but it leads us toward a shared responsibility, regardless of whether we feel that we ourselves have engaged in racist behavior. Just as white people cannot simply look at black people as the other, neither can we simply point to other overtly racist white people and call them the other. We are them. Their wrongs are our wrongs, and their need for repentance is our need for repentance. Yet social exile continues to occur in our country as violence against people of color continues. Discrimination is still a thing, and while we may not want to admit it, we must face the stark reality of it. Currently, I see many people on Facebook and around the world speaking about Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King in a glowing light, and they point to the peaceful protests he made, but they are conveniently forgetting the times that hoses were blasted upon those peaceful protesters. They conveniently forget the dogs that were loosed upon those protesters. They even forget what happened at Kent State. Now, I must admit, much of that occurred before I was born, even though I'm almost 50 years old. But I am a student of history. I also have access to one of the greatest resources and sometimes curses in the world today called the Internet. And I have watched videos from beginning to end of those peaceful protesters attacked in the past and in the present. And they look a lot alike. The same thing is occurring throughout our history because we refuse to repent. As the old saying goes, no matter how much things change, they stay the same. So what does it look like then to garden literally and metaphorically in these spaces? As Jeremiah asked, what does it look like to seek the welfare of our city when we are living simultaneously into two of the biggest crises our country has ever seen? Well, the bishops of the southeastern jurisdiction of the United Methodist Church have put together 
a statement which I believe gives us direction along these lines. I've only changed one word in their statement. I changed the word bishop to Christian. We, the white Christians of the southeastern jurisdiction of the United Methodist Church, call upon all United Methodists to stand with and see our black brothers and sisters. As white American Christians, we stand up and stand with our black Christians in the church who have consistently named and called out the systemic and sinful practice of discrimination that has been pervasive in the United States since the first slaves walked the shores of this land. For our failure to join our sisters and brothers, we ask forgiveness. As white American Christians, we stand up and stand with the black communities across our Episcopal areas, recognizing that we who have been in positions of power and privilege have been silent. In our silence, we have and do sin. We implore United Methodists across the southeastern jurisdiction of the United Methodist Church to exercise influence and power to be agents of repentance, reconciliation, reformation, and restoration in a system that has failed to bring hope to all God's children of color. As white American Christians, we stand up and stand with all persons who live in fear of the very systems designed to protect them. As white American Christians, we stand up and stand with all persons whose anger has reached the point of intolerance due to failure after failure to change systemic racial injustice which has created the climate where black lives can be snuffed out without consequence. As white American Christians, we stand up, stand with, and stand against any systems of injustice that treat people differently because of the color of their skin. We call on the people called Methodist to live fully into our baptismal vows to renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of our sin. We believe that the soul of our nation needs to be examined, which means that each person individually needs to engage in self-examination. Self-examination includes educating oneself about the roots of racism from slavery to lynching to racial segregation and Jim Crow to contemporary presumptions of guilt, incarceration, and police violence. Self-examination means scrutinizing one's beliefs, attitudes, and actions. A good beginning place for many of us would be to read Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail written in 1963. God calls us individually and collectively to take action. In our baptism, we are called to accept the freedom and power given by God to resist evil, injustice, and oppression, however, wherever, and whenever they are present. We, the white American Christians of the southeastern jurisdiction of the United Methodist Church, cry out to the people of the United Methodist Church to unite our hearts, our minds, our souls, and our strength now to step into this present brokenness by seeing those we have chosen not to see. We do so believing that out of the pain of the tragic deaths of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Eric Garner, Philando Castile, Trayvon Martin, and countless others whose names have faded that the senseless killings will stop and healing can begin. Let us now this day stand up and stand with our black brothers and sisters so that we will be united as one body in Christ, redeemed by his blood. May we be one in Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory. This is our deepest prayer. And now we have a holy work before us. We ask you to join us in recommitting ourselves to non-violently exposing and opposing injustice, racism, and violence, even when it resides in our own 
hearts. We must not allow our righteous indignation and prophetic calls for justice to become spiritually hollow with no moral integrity to speak into a world that is in desperate need of the fresh bread of hope. We hear and see it in the protests. The world grows weary of injustice where the marginalized become voiceless and invisible living at the mercy of power. If we are unwilling to walk the path of Jesus Christ and truly acknowledge our white privilege, then all our statements simply become high-sounding, pontificated documents joining other statements gathering dust on the shelves of empty promises. With your prayers and actions joined with ours, we can answer the cries we hear in the midst of protest, cries of injustice, fear and anger that when gone unanswered turn violent. If Jesus is indeed the answer, let us dare to see one another as beloved children of the living God, deserving of love, mercy, and justice. We should offer our examples to the church. In the name of Jesus Christ, this is our work, and we dare not abandon it or the world because we desire privilege and power over what the Lord requires of us. I'd add a caveat there. The bishop said we desire privilege and power over what the Lord requires of us. I think a lot of people aren't worried about privilege and power. They're just happy with the status quo. They're happy with just the way things have been and have always been. But this for us here at Matthew's Memorial is a season of Pentecost. And the season of Pentecost is a season of change. We cannot be happy with the status quo any longer. We cannot be happy with the status quo because the status quo gives place to power and privilege as we sit and do nothing. And so join with us in this holy work of dismantling racism in its subtle and overt forms. If not us, who? If not now, when? Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. Now please join with me in our confession of sin this morning as we confess our sins before God and one another. Creator God, being faithful has never been easy. You asked Noah to build a ship you ask the Israelites to plant gardens and build homes while in exile. You ask the prophets to speak challenging truths. You ask the disciples to drop their nets and follow you. And you asked us to love bigger than society wants us to. Being faithful has never been easy. And as a result, we often miss the mark. Forgive us for holding tightly to human-made plans. Forgive us for the times we say no to you so that we can say yes to ourselves. Unravel the grip we have on our agenda so that we can make room for you. Gratefully we pray. Amen. And now remember these words. In the name of Jesus Christ. You are forgiven. <laughs>